Dope. Egyptian lover. How yes. are you, brother? I'm uh-huh. good, man. Man, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this interview is because, you know, I I respect you so much, and I believe you deserve your flowers and your respect, you know, uh, for being a West Coast pioneer. And I, in my opinion, I believe you don't get enough respect, you know, and I want to try to change that. And I want to let all the younger artists and I want to let all the other fans and stuff like that really, like, know about your life and your career and the impact that you've had on, on music, you know, and especially here on the West Coast. So I just wanted to do this interview because, you know, I respect you so much, you know, and I, as a legend, as a, as a, as a pioneer and even an icon, you know. For sure, appreciate it. Uh, man, you know, back when I was a, a kid, I mean, my, my older sister used to have their albums, and they were like gold to me. You know, I, I'd put them on, listen to them. The next day I'd go to school, and I'd be like, you know, I'm the Egyptian lover with the hard rock beat, jamming so hard I make <laughs> a grandma freak, you know. <laughs> I'd, I'd be saying those lines in, like, in junior high and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, I, 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 I love those albums. Uh, one, but one of the things I want to start off with is that uh, one of your songs, you know, what is a DJ if you can't scratch? What is an MC if you can't rap? What is a beat without a live clap? To me, you were letting everybody know before there was even a term called a super producer that you were an MC, you were a producer, you were a DJ, you were all those elements that a lot of these icons like Dr. Dre, DJ Quick and others later on became, you know? Exactly. So, um, man, I, I, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, um, your, your career as, 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 a uh, uh, your recording career. I mean, how did you take off from a DJ into, uh, into all those things, a producer, a rapper and a, and a DJ, you know? Well, I think I was a rapper first. So I was making um mixtapes for my high school and um I put Rapper's Delight on it. And I guess the first five people that bought my mixtape said, Man, I love this this um Rapper's Delight. Do you have any other songs like this? I'm like, There is no other song like that. I said, Tell you what, I'll I'll make one for you. I'll I'll rap on a on an instrumental beat and I'll bring you to school next week. And so when I brought them to school next week, they sold so fast I had to, you know, make some make some more, make some more. Pretty soon I was selling mixtapes with raps on them, like maybe 30 cassettes, <laughs> like in two days. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Had to raise the price to like eight bucks. <laughs> and um, it was just selling, selling, selling. Then I rose, rose the price to $10, which was unheard of back then for uh-huh. a cassette tape. And I would just sell them out. I mean, I bought a brick full of cassettes and was just dubbing them all night long. I didn't get any tickets for school the next day. Just kept wow. dubbing them every, every hour, just changing them over and, and go to school with 30 tapes, 50 tapes, and, and sell them all, like, within, within the first 30 minutes when I'm at school. You still, having your, uh, you still have any of those I tapes? wish I did. <laughs> I think oh I got God, one man. somewhere, it like, but, It would man. be, like, gold today, man. Like, you, you yeah, everybody I, I contacted, they, they don't know where they are. People stole them, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it was, like, one of the early, early raps. And then, of course, um, Curtis Blow came out after that, and then Grandma's Flash, and then there was a lot more rap. And it was it was it was pretty cool. So I was always a rapper before I even thought about DJing. But I was making pause button mixtapes. So uh-huh. like I would take I only had one turntable at home and a cassette deck and I would repeat this the record over and over again, spinning it back, repeating, spinning it back and repeating, not knowing I was kinda of DJing for myself, doing using a cassette deck as a um a recorder, holding a pause button and, and unpausing it on a certain part of the record I wanted to, to record and pausing it again and then unpausing it and just repeating it over and over again so the record could repeat like I'm DJing, but I'm not really DJing, I'm just doing pause button mixtapes. So one day, um, this grown man walked up to my school while I was getting on the, the bus to come home and he said, Egyptian lover, and I'm like, uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> wow. like, you made this tape and he showed me the tape. I'm like, oh my goodness. His daughter must have had the tape, and he heard it, and heard all the crazy <laughs> curse words, and he about to kill me. He says, I own a club out here um, in the valley, and um, I want to know if you can do what's on this tape at my club. I'm like, sure. He said, I'll give you um, $1,000. I'm like, oh, definitely. <laughs> so I went home, 
and only had one turntable. I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy wants me to do these mixes that I did on cassette at the, at the club. I don't know how to do these mixes with, with two turntables. I don't know how to do it with the pause button. So my brother and one of my best friends um, was brainstorming, like, how can we make this record repeat three times when we only have two turntables? So we brought another turntable. And um, my brother said, well, you know, you know how to make it go twice. So you can go like, like, um, like, baby, 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 baby. So you repeat that twice by using two records. But I can uh-huh. have you go a third time. He said, well, while the second one is playing on the left, take the right one and spin it backwards and then hit it back forward on the beat. And so we tried it. And then my friend said, yeah, and call it the triple threat. And so I created the triple threat with the help of my brother and my friend. <laughs> and wow. So I, started, I started doing it over and over and over again. So I got really good at it. And then uh, my brother said, um, the record always starts when the when the label is pointing at this certain position. So you can spin the record back when that label goes back to that certain position, you know where the record starts. Mm-hmm. You you really have to don't have to use the headphones, you can just spin it back. So I'm listening and I turn the headphones down real low so I can hear a little bit of it. And I spin it back and it always repeat always started where that label was a certain area. So I knew mm-hmm. where every record started by looking at the label. So I didn't have to put stickers on it, I just kinda of memorized where the label was when the, when the record started. So I practiced for like a whole week, learned how to mix and DJ, bought some records. Went to, my uncle took me to the club. I'm getting ready to DJ. And he said, oh, I don't want you to DJ. He's the owner told me this. He said, I want you to do the rap. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> damn. I learned how to you DJ for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I got on the stage and I did the rap and it was easy. Got my $1,000. And my uncle was like, man, that was pretty cool. <laughs> and went on. Wow. like, man, but I learned how to DJ for nothing. So. Now I know how to DJ, so now I'm doing house parties and I'm DJing and I'm, you know doing different things. Uh, people are saying like, "Man, you're pretty good DJing." What do you call this kind of mixing? I'm like, "It's just mixing." And I heard Grandma's Flash put a record out um, called Grandma's Flash on the on the Wheels of Steel, mm-hmm. and I heard him scratching, and I didn't know what scratching was. And I'm, to myself, I thought, "Oh, that's cueing the record out loud." I know how to cue the record. I used to do it with the pause button mixtape. And I accidentally did it on one of the tapes, but never called it scratching. Like, yeah. That's just cueing the record out loud, so I'm not to do that. So the next part I did, I was doing a little scratching there, but I was like, wow, wow, wow. So <laughs> then one day, me and my um, friend named Snake Puppy, who later joined the L.A. Dream Team, we were making yes. mixtapes together. We were doing rap tapes together. And we were in the mall. And uh, the the creator of Uncle Jam's Army named Roger Clayton, he passed away in 2010, but... Back then, it was like 83, 82, 83. And he was walking down the mall, passing out flyers, and my boy Snake Puppy said, Yo, Uncle Jam's Army, you guys got the best dance promotion team around, but you don't have the best DJ. And Roger said, Who's the best DJ? He said, My boy here, Egyptian Lover. And Roger looked at me and said, Man, you can DJ? I'm like, Yeah. He said, Y'all always ask me to rap on the mic. I always say no, but you can DJ? I'm like, Yeah. So he said, Come with me. So I went with him to make a commercial for the, the next party. And um, the next party, he just said it was a DJ contest. Never told me it was a DJ contest. He said it was a DJ yeah. contest. And so I went up there and I DJ did my thing. They tried to sabotage me, but nothing worked. And I just killed the turntables. And everybody just like, wow, they stopped dancing. They were looking at me, standing on chairs and tables, looking at me DJ. And I'm like, whoa, I don't know if this is good because they're supposed to be dancing. <laughs> If I can remember a previous conversation that I had with you, from my recollection, they gave you the worst record to work with, correct? Exactly. They gave me Aretha Franklin jump to it. (laughs) And I killed it. I kept kept mixing the beginning beat over and over again and scratch and jump. And jump, jump, chicka, jump, jump. And it just killed the record. Everybody was watching. And I thought I was in trouble. But, man, Roger came and said, man, that's you doing this? I'm like, yeah. He said, what <laughs> records do you want? So he started giving me the records I wanted, and I started killing the turntables. And I became the DJ for Uncle Jam's Army. All the other DJs who came for the contest, they turned around and walked away. Wow. Wow, man. I wish there was video of this. <laughs> man, I wish there was. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, yeah, I mean, you know, Uncle Jam's Army, I mean, what more can we say? I mean, they laid the, you know, you guys laid the foundation, you know. Uh, you know, you were putting out music, you know, you're doing the dance parties that had like 10,000 people at the sports arena. And it was uh, all new. It was all brand new to everybody. So, I mean, like when songs were coming out, like Planet Rock, it was brand new. 
Nobody heard mm-hmm. these songs before. So we were playing these songs at these parties, and it was just a new thing for everybody. I mean, synthesizers were new. Drum machines were new. I brought a drum machine to the party. Nobody even knew what a drum machine was. I didn't know a week before I brought it to the party what a drum machine was. And wow. things just took off. I and mean, it was just every, know, every day was like a, a week. <laughs> you know, I, I've had a drum machine in my presence before, and I've tried to, like, mess around with it. How the hell did you learn it so quickly and so easily? Man, I think it was just just like DJing. It just it just came to me, and and um, I had um, the guy at the Guitar Center who worked there kind of showed me how to program it, and I uh-huh. vaguely remembered it when I went home. And then um, I did the basic stuff. Then another friend of mine said his friend was a drummer who actually had an 808, so I went over to his house. And he showed me how to do part two and, and make the beats longer and how to do feels. And mm-hmm. I'm like, ah, oh. so then I started doing a little bit more. So all within that week, I learned as much as I could about the 808, then brought it to the dance and played it for 10,000 mm. people. Wow. That's crazy because, you know, I listen to songs like, you know, Egypt, Egypt, and the beats to those things are like, to me, they sound so damn complex. I yeah, mean, there's so many different layers complex. and so many different things going on. You know, you, you're listening maybe like, like to the drum beat, but then there's something else over that. And there's right. like, you know, a snare and or there's a, you know, a synthesizer going on. And there's, you know, I mean, there's so many different elements, you know. And I'm just amazed and blown away at the genius of the, of the music, you know. Man, that was a young 18, 19-year-old brain doing that. <laughs> wow. I, I mean, I used the whole drum machine to make one song and, you know, just, just programming beats and changing them up. And I don't do that today. You know, it's more a couple of two patterns max. But back then, mm-hmm. I used all 16 patterns, fills, and everything to make that beat. Wow. How long did it take you to make, like, a song like Egypt, Egypt? Well, actually, Egypt, Egypt was going to be a different song, and I, I kind of changed my mind in the studio. So that song was actually made in the studio that day. So maybe it took probably took me an hour to do all the beats over and erase them and reprogram them and, and you know, change them around. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy and wild back then. Wow. My mind was going a mile, a million miles an hour, and and it was no stopping. Mhm. That's a, that's amazing. Did anybody help you with it, or did you just do all this on your own? It was, it was just me. I mean, I had um the engineer could play keyboards a little bit, so he would play for me. My brother could play keyboards, he would play for me, and um I'd play myself, and you know by ear I would use the vocoder. So actually. Egypt, Egypt is actually in D, and I did the vocoder in A, which is not supposed to. It's supposed to be in D, but it sounded better in A, and I just did it in A, and it worked. Wow. And even the writing of the music, the songs, the lyrics, and all that, yeah. and that all just came to you. Sat like, there and pulled out my book of raps and just pulled some together and, and created Egypt, Egypt. Sometimes I'll just make the beat in the studio and let it play, and I'll sit there and write the rap while the music is playing in the studio. Uh huh. Wow. I like how you know you switch up the beat every now and then, like you drop something like right in the middle of the song, and just you know, and then go back to it afterwards. You know what I mean? That's you know, um, yeah, like pre breakdowns and and stuff like yeah. that. That means, yeah. That's been coming from like going to Uncle Jam Murray parties and and dancing. I just mm-hmm. love when the beat changes a little bit and then it comes back and then it breaks down, you know. So it makes you mm-hmm. just dance harder. So that's I just had that dance vibe in my head when I was making beats and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I also loved about your your, your music is that you'd give us like a, a dance song like Egypt Egypt, and then you'd give us something for the streets like you know like my beat goes boom, you know you change it up where you're not dancing but you're like. Nodding your head like all right, my beat goes boom, boom, right. boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know that that shit was dope. You know, tell me about the making of that song because I've always loved that song. Man, I think I was on my way to the studio and a crazy song came on a rock station, and a guy was talking about a girl walking down the street and when she walked, she went boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, oh, that was kind of clever how he said that. But uh-huh. I'm gonna do it like this, and I kind of heard it in my head and when I got to the studio I did the beat and then um said that my beat go boom 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 so I was kind of singing yeah. to the beat 
and it worked. Wow. I like how you did like a backwards uh, uh, thing, right? You know, in the middle of the song, you know, you, it was like a, like, you know, how you play a record backwards and you're, you right. know. Uh, I, did, I, I played did that on it, Egypt, I Egypt as well. One time. What's that? I did that on Egypt, Egypt as well. So the breathing you hear on Egypt, Egypt is actually going forward and backward. That's why it's going, oh. whoa. So the whoop is going backwards. So I did the breathing backwards on Egypt, Egypt. And then on what is a DJ, I flipped it and said, how about menage toi, menage toi, me and you. And yep. I, played it, I, I played it forward. <laughs> <laughs> me and my sister played it forward one time because we wanted to know what you were talking about. And I didn't even know what a menage a was at the time. But I, <laughs> I, I went to school the next day talking about, yeah, he's talking about something like a menage a And then later on I learned, like, what it was. And I was like, oh, shit. He's just talking about, you know, two chicks and, you know, it's like, that was crazy. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, but, but, but again, I liked how, you know, um, it was a different feel than what the other song, you know, like in Egypt, Egypt was, you know. Right. Um, and then, of course, you know, there was What is a DJ, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you know, you were giving us different flavors, you know, and it wasn't just like strictly just, you know, one right. thing. But each yeah. was my, my main love. I mean, that was my style. I love that up tempo stuff. Mm-hmm. And um me and with Uncle Jam's Army, I knew we had to play different songs, you know, at different times throughout the night. So I did those other songs like to play What is a DJ early and Big O Boom mid time and then mm-hmm. you know, each beach later on. Then my next album I did some Prince type stuff with guitars. Kinda mm-hmm. like what I did on my brand new album nineteen eighty six. But you still get that Egypt Egypt style stuff on songs like yeah. Cyborg and monster and alien freaking and then i did some um slower stuff it sounds slower but actually the beat is faster cinnamon oil massage then i did some i need a freak stuff like freaky girl and i did a prince song called volcanic so the brand new album has all that old old egypt on there and people are actually loving it i mean it's selling like crazy right now yeah you know i love that remake of i need a freak that you made man that shit was hard Boom, yeah, when boom, I heard boom. sexual harassment, I was like, oh, that's my style right there. That's Prince and <laughs> that's me. Yeah, that, that went hard. Woo. Man, I was thinking about it the other day, as a matter of fact. You know, I was like, I need a freak. To, you know, I need a freak every day and every night. <laughs> Have you heard the new album yet? 1986. I, I started going through it, yes. Yeah, so that's why I wanted to do the thing so we could promote the album. And we yeah, you got to check out Freaky Girl. Freaky Girl is like, I need a freak part too. It's, it's nice. Cool. Nice, nice. Um, you you know, Uncle Jam's Army put out some songs, but it sounded like it was you basically doing Yeah, well, it. I was actually producing it and writing it, so I was actually pretty much doing 90% of everything on there. Because they, uh, um, well, Girls, 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 was that you or Uncle Jam's Army? That was me. Okay, yeah, girl. Okay, I remember girl. So Uncle Jam's Army was yes, Dollar yes, yes, Freak. and Dollar Freak, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Dollar Freak. I remember your hello, baby. Yeah, and that was, that was your voice, I believe. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about those albums and those records. I mean, you know, Uncle Jam's Army started putting out music and you were producing them. Um, Yo, uh, after the sports arena, when I played the drum machine, Roger looked over at me like, man. The crowd was loving it. I said, yes, we need to make a record. So we went to the studio probably that week. And um, we, I, I wrote Dollar Freak and Yes, 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 and we did it in the studio that week. We did both songs like in the same day. Mm-hmm. And um, we, we hurried up and put them out. And um, back then, you can get a record pressed in a week. <laughs> we got it pressed up. And probably two weeks later, when we had another party, we premiered the song, and people just loved it. Brought it to yeah. the radio station, and they could not stop playing it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Down the Freak was dope. I remember my sister had that album, that that record, and uh, I remember I was like, "Hello, baby, what the scene? Yeah. Can I pick you up in my limousine?" <laughs> yeah, it was straight LA style. I mean, the freak, everything was was freak in LA, and our parties was full of freaks, and everything was freak, freak, freak. And, and that song just came out, and it was like it was an LA big hit. And then yeah. it started, you know, start traveling, start going like to Detroit and. Texas and Florida and I had went back to the studio and did Egypt Egypt like another two weeks after Dollar Freak and um, Roger was saying oh no you can't put that record out right now because this record is out you gotta wait at least six months <laughs> so we waited I held that record for six months man it was burning my burning my hand 
like, man, I got to wait, got to wait, got to wait. And then six, seven months later, I released it, and that was it. That's crazy. And Yes, Yes, Yes was basically just you guys saying the yes on the record. That was just basically, there was really no lyrics. It was just saying, like, yes. Oh, no, it was lyrics, too. Was there? It was, it was, yeah, it was verses in there as well. Oh, okay, because I remember just saying, yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there was a bunch of lyrics on there. It was a full song. And crazy beats. I mean, the drum machine on that is, is, is unheard of. But it was those beats I was using at the sports arena, and it was hitting them certain Vegas speakers hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know another favorite of, of mine was girls. Um, man, I love that part where you just start dropping names. You know, Lisa Sharon. Me, da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was pretty. Dope. That's my favorite part of the song, man. When you just start, <laughs> you just start dropping them names, Lisa yep. Sharon. And we kind of did them in two two takes. So we did one right side and one left side. So we put the headphones on there, bouncing back and forth, left and right. Wow. That's crazy, you know. And it, and, it, and what's amazing to me is that you know, uh, you were a youngster when you were making all this, and and and, and um, you know, when I was that age, I mean, I wasn't even thinking of anything <laughs> so complex, you know. Uh, I think listening yeah. to um, Prince albums and and the albums that were coming out at that time gave mm-hmm. me a lot of ideas. So my creative imagination was just just gone. Like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I need to go mm-hmm. to the studio, and I would go to the studio, and like, all oh, these ideas would come out, and I would tell the engineer, how can we do this, 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 and this? And he'd say, okay, we can do this this way, this this way, and this this way. Okay, let's do it. And mm-hmm. we do it. Nice. Wow. Um, the L.A. scene, you know, um, really took off afterwards. You know, we all know what happened after that, you know. Um do you feel like it forgot you in any way, like, after that? Like, do you feel like, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm here and I did my thing, you know what I mean? And, you know. No, because I kind of left L.A. and kind of went everywhere else. So, okay, you know, the whole time, I, um, I think in the in the 90s, early 90s, I was still mm-hmm. just, just on tour. I've been, I've been on tour since 84 and I haven't stopped. So wow, so you kinda, go all over the world and play. Well, I was all over the United States at that time. So uh-huh. I would do, like, in, in Louisiana and in the South area. I think I was mm-hmm. just there for, like, 10 years straight. They they were just blowing up just, just every weekend, a bigger a bigger show in, Louis, in Louisiana and in the South area. And it was just wow. like I made a whole greatest hits called The King of Ecstasy just because they were just in love with all these up-tempo songs. And so I would just... Keep doing shows out there. Keep doing shows and all over. You know, you know, come back to LA and then do a show out here with other people. And, and I'm hearing the change in the music in LA, but it's, mm-hmm. it's still in different spots in in America. It's still happening. So you know, like um, somebody like Salt and Pepper come out with Push It. So that up tempo stuff is still happening. And yeah. So I come out with his stuff. So everybody every year somebody come out with up tempo song and it's still happening. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm still doing my stuff. And then in mm-hmm. 2004, I started going to Europe, and man, it's, it's like L.A. all over again everywhere I go. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And I've been doing that since 2004, and now, you know, to 2021, I'm still getting bookings like crazy in Europe. Wow. That's great, man. I'm, I'm so glad, like, people, like, are you know, all over the world appreciate your music. And you know, and and can uh, respect it and, and understand it and love it. Um, uh, they call it. We don't. They don't call it hip hop. They call it the electro out there. It was like uh, electro funk, electro, and man, it's just it a is big electro. Thing. But I, I call it hip hop because you were rapping yeah. and you it's were hip hop is old school. Yeah, yeah. And another dance arm, we just call it dance music. Exactly. Um, I wish that there was. I know that there's been talk of like documentaries and stuff like that, but I really wish like I could go on Netflix right now and just put on an Uncle Jam's Army doc, you know, exactly. and just learn about all of you guys and and have everybody else learn about all you guys, you know. Because I, yeah, I was we, there. We did a small Alex, one. We did a small uh, one on with um Red Bull, and it's on YouTube right now. So you put Uncle Jam's Army documentary, it'll pop up. It's a okay. short one. It's probably like only fifteen twenty minutes long, but it's pretty cool. That's so. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I was there. At the, you guys had a reunion right before the sports arena was was demolished. Uh, right. I was there the at the park with you guys, and uh, you know, 
and it was great seeing uh, a lot of guys come together. Um, I know that, you know, Roger passed, and it, I wish, you know, he could have been there to, you know, to, to be a part yeah. of all that. Uh, but it was nice seeing a lot of uh, things come together, you know. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and you guys really have a, a real history here, and I just think it needs to be celebrated and just, you Definitely. know. You know. So let's talk about the new album, man. I mean, this is the third of of your of, uh, of your nineteen eighty collection. Yeah, your eighty yeah. series. Um, nineteen eighty six. Man, you've been on a mission putting out three albums. You know. Oh yeah, and they're all back, studio albums. They're not home studio. They're real studio albums. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the quality is is huge. Sweet, and you're basically taking everybody back to the dance floor, right? Exactly. Taking them back to the 80s, and, and you'll hear the real drum machine, the real analog spin. You hear, you know, me doing my old school rapping, and I did a lot of different vocal techniques on the new album. So, like on Volcano, we mm-hmm. did a pitch, a pitched voice, you know, pitched up voice. On Cyborg, we use a different um, kind of technique to make the voice more of a robotic cyborg instead of a vocoder. And then regular voice as well, like on Freaky Girl and and cinnamon oil massage, you hear the the old school 80s Egyptian lover. So, I mean, wow. the album came out really well. And, man, we, we printed them up, and they sold so fast. And print them up again, they sold out again. Now we're on our third press. I'm going to pick them up probably tomorrow. And I already got orders for half of those already. It's like, man, they, they're selling too fast. It's a good thing, but, man, it's selling <laughs> fast. So you're selling the, the vinyls, correct? Yeah, we're selling the vinyls, CD, and tapes. Even cassette wow. tapes and cassette wow. tapes are, are are people are buying boom boxes on eBay and and playing these cassettes and like man it's for like the old school I mean it, it gives you that old school feeling so you gotta have that old school boom box or CD player or something to, to, to capture it or a turntable to capture the vinyl I mean you can have you can buy it online like on Bandcamp you can buy the WAV files or you know mm-hmm. streaming or something but to get the full feeling you gotta have it on vinyl CD or tape you should um sell like signed copies and like double the price or something. <laughs> no, I keep regular price, regular price and I sign them. Oh, okay. Okay. If they order, okay. If they order from me through um, Instagram or Facebook. I'll mm-hmm. sign them and, and ship them out. So I got like a wow. hundred of them signed right now. My nephew is shipping them out. <laughs> <laughs> that's sweet, man. That's, I'm glad that, that, that that's happening. And, you know, people ordering them and, uh, you know, I, I mean, if you watch Snowfall, they even play some of your music sometimes. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that was incredible. I like that. And that's yeah, how it was yeah. back in the day. I mean, people was losing their mind for, for that sound, and it was fun. Yeah, that's what I tell people all the time. You know, I'm like, man, like, watch Snowfall, and you'll really hear what L.A. was, and see what L.A. was like before, you know, there was listening to N.W.A. or Ice T or anything like that. Like, you know, they, I mean, you got, like, these gangsters driving around to, to electro music, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what it was. I mean, that's, that's that, it was just a feel good kind of music. Even today, it's mm-hmm. just a feel good kind of music. And you gotta yeah. have you gotta have all kinds of music. You, know, you can't just live your whole life with one kind of music. You gotta put sure. other kind of music into your life. So you can, you're you're in a different mood throughout the day. You're not in the same one mood the whole day because then you'd be a boring yeah. person. But you can yeah. change your mood up and do different things. And you know, I mean, even back in the day, we had. People making slow tapes, you know, you go to the swap meeting, buy a slow jams tape, and you might have a girl in the car, you pop in a slow jam tape, you know, different yeah. moves for different occasions. So yeah. you gotta you gotta broaden your music, you know, and and just live it, live the good life. But, but I think you know the party music was so valuable because that's where people came to meet. They came yeah, to they dance, heard new they music came. there. They heard new music. They heard it loud. They heard it, you know, me a lot of we had like a hundred Serum Vegas speakers. So they come mm-hmm. to our party, they heard these brand new songs real loud. The first time they ever heard Run DMC, they heard it through those speakers, like, wow, what is this? First time mm-hmm. they heard Herbie Hancock's Rocket, they heard it through those big speakers, and like, whoa, what is this? First time they heard Dollar Freak and Each of Egypt through those speakers, and they're like, okay, this is a hit. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, just having that party and the radio station coming and listen to what we're playing, because they're not playing this kind of music. They're listening mm-hmm. to what we're playing, then they would cop, write it down and go play it on their stations, and other DJs will come and say, wow. And then we had a record store as well. So we'll play records knowing we don't even have this record. Come to our record store and buy it. <laughs> People will be lined up the next day at the record store. Okay, I need this record, this record, this record, and this record. Double. Yeah. 
I wish I wish the later generations could have experienced something like that, you know, because you can't really have big parties like that without it getting turned out, you know, by 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 bullshit shooting and stuff like that. Well, but it depends on what kind of music you're playing. If you're playing yeah. nothing but gangster rap, everybody gonna have that gangster rap mood, and your party gonna get turned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I wish there would have been like you know ten thousand people at a sports arena, you know, and I could have been there, or or the just later generations could have just experienced that, you know. Exactly. Um, but that's great. You know, um, man, tell us where and how we can buy your new album. Uh, you can buy it on Bandcamp.com. You can download it there. If you want mm-hmm. vinyl, um, pretty much all the record stores have it, like Amoebas and, and all over the world. You know, different record stores are already ordered them up, and they mm-hmm. have them in stock. Or you can just go hit me up on um, Instagram at The Egyptian Lover and um, ask for an album, and you can buy one from me. Wow, that's incredible. Great. Um, what's next for you after this series? Uh, uh, you, what, what's, what's on your horizon? Oh, I'm right in the middle of writing some screenplays right now, so I think that's my next career jump will be getting into the movie business and the film industry. And nice. I'm, I got like seven screenplays working on right now, and different kind of things like sci-fi, my my own biopic, just different things. So it's, it's pretty fun. Been 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 you know locked down since the pandemic started. So I said, well, I might as well just take this time and, and, and make it make it work for me. So now I got time to write, and instead of writing songs, I'm writing film. Sweet, uh, an Egyptian lover biopic would be awesome. Yeah, so I'm working on that too, and all the crazy stories are in there, and it, it, <laughs> it's gonna be wild. <laughs> That's dope. Well, Egypt, thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to you know to me today, and for WestCoastStyles.com, we appreciate you, and man, you know anything you're doing. We're going to be behind and pushing it. Just know that. So Great. Great. All right, brother, I'm going to let you go ahead and get to your day. Um, again, thank you for being our guest. And, man, you know, uh, uh, just keep just keep doing it, you know. Keep making you history. You too, man. Keep doing your thing. All right, brother. Thank you. All right, man. Bye. Bye.